Thank you. Thank you again to the uh, sponsors and organizers of this. It's, it's really a pleasure to be able to um, also be involved in putting together these workshops and invite the kinds of really uh, stimulating speakers here today and, and be involved in them. One of the things, though, that, that I've, I should learn about this is that you know, being an organizer and then, then bringing in the keynote speakers, last year I had to follow Buzz Holling, and this year I have to follow Bob Ulanowitz, and so I'm setting up these challenges that I can't uh, maybe meet. But anyways, we'll do our best. So um, as Harold mentioned, that today's talk is Ecosystem Resilience in the Adaptive Cycle. Uh, I spend most of my time at Towson University in Maryland in the U.S. and, um, and the summers uh, just south of here in Yasa. So some of the objectives that I'll talk about today are a little bit of an overview of what, what I mean by system sustainability and then get into ecosystem dynamics, specifically the adaptive cycle, um, the collapse response with some focus on that, and then trying to look at this adaptive cycle in terms of some of the other ecosystem properties that are um, being studied as well. So, so again, why ecology? You know, why, why this emphasis on, on nature and, and ecological uh, questions, and I found this quote when I was reading recently that I had not fully appreciated how much ecological perspective can alter how we see the rest of the world. And that was a, another plug for Bob's uh, a third window. So, so again, the ecological perspective is, you know, really does encompass a lot of these ideas of sustainability uh, quite nicely. And it really starts with, uh, and we heard a little bit about this already this morning, about the, the openness uh, question and the openness importance that all ecosystems are open systems. They're always having energy that are flowing through them. And so we can look at these as the input state output models where there's a source of energy and material and then there's also a sink that is receiving the energy material at the end of that. So they uh, contain and, and construct and maintain immense order within them because they are taking in this high quality energy input or this low entropy energy and then they're extracting the low quality, high entropy energy at the end after they use that. But in the middle, they're doing all the wonderful um, things that we see systems doing. And we see this with ecosystems where the sun is the primary driver of the energy source and the, the very simplified food web there, the heat generated. Uh, we see this with, um, with human systems where we also have inputs of energy and, and other materials as well. But you know, the, at the break talking about the idea of boundary conditions and, and we sometimes lose sight of the boundary conditions if we're too focused only on the system but we have to understand that these are open systems and, and again natural systems being solar driven have that constraint that they've been working within um, we're able to oftentimes find additional inputs to drive our systems but are they sustainable that's I guess one of the questions so leading to the next slide is sustainability really comes down to this very simple input output model. A, a system would be sustainable depending on whether the inputs are sustainable and whether the outputs are sustainable. Those are both uh, the, the kind of the key questions we need to ask. And this isn't really a new idea. Daly and Townsend had published this back in 93 uh, in a book called Valuing the Earth where they said that you know, renewable resources should be exploited in a manner such that the harvesting, harvesting rates are, are less than the regeneration rates and the waste emissions uh, should be less than the renewable assimilative capacity of the environment. In other words, you have to be sustainable on the input side, you have to be able to sustainable on the output side. The places where the waste goes have to be able to be absorbed and you shouldn't, um, you know, if you start running out of resources, that's also uh, cause for concern. So what are some of the input constraints in ecosystems? Well, solar radiation is being really the first one, but we also have things like how fast are things being able to cycle and be reused, the global carbon cycle, nutrient cycles, the hydrologic cycle. And, and sustainability then depends on these. these. These provide constraints to the system structure that can be created. On the output side, we have things like rate of decomposition, rate of accumulation of unwanted byproducts. Uh, you know, it's, it's oftentimes a, a goal of finding others to take your waste, and nature is very good at creating these cycles and, and finding something productive to do with that output. We don't have trash cans in nature. Everything ends up getting reincorporated. So we've got ecosystems that are developing these very complex structures that are um, with, built within these constraints. I mean, in other words, they, they've kind of, you know, they're not recognizing anything in an in a overtly conscious way, but they are dealing with these constraints quite effectively. So can we learn something by understanding the patterns of organization that we see in ecosystems and, and then hopefully apply those patterns and that understanding to our, our human social systems as well? What kind of complexity do we actually see there? So how do we measure this, this complexity? That's one of the key questions for ecosystem science, I think, is finding different ways 
of, of measuring this controlled growth, this complexity, this order that we see in ecosystems. They're just, you know, three simple pictures of, uh, but very complex systems, right? You know, we see this every time we look out in nature. We see evidence of complexity out there. So that's one of the key questions. How do we actually measure this? Well, some attempts that have been used by various ecologists along the way are, are looking at different weighted measures, a kind of an intensive, extensive combination here. Emergy analysis is one of those. Maybe we'll hear a little bit more about that from Sergio later this morning. Um, the idea here, again, this idea that it's a, it's a weighted value is, is basically the E term there is the energy that's available in the system. So it's a, it's a measure of how much actual biomass you have, the energy term. And this, this tau is a transformity that is weighting it based on how much transformations there was from the original solar energy input. So the more, the further down you are in the food chain, the more heavily weighted that value is. The, the idea being that a, bio, a kilogram of biomass of a cheetah is different complexity than a kilogram of biomass of the grass because it first was transformed into the gazelle and then into the cheetah. And so you've got to take into account for that transformity that is taking place there. Ecoexergy was a measure that was developed uh, by Sven Jorgensen to look at not necessarily how the uh, path that the system took to get there, but the end result of the complexity in terms of the genetic complexity of that system. So here we have the C is the actual concentration of energy, and the, the beta term is his weighting function based on the DNA genetic complexity of that organism. So again, the, the, the cheetah presumably has a more complex DNA than the, than the grass, even though we're still doing a lot of research to find out uh, about that. But he's published some tables that are showing the approximate uh, weighting factors, complexity based on, on the genomic uh, data that they have. So it's another way of looking at complexity that is there. And the third one we heard a little bit about this morning, um, uh, that Bobby Lanowitz has, has developed ascendancy, and, and in many ways I think this is a, a preferred approach because it's a network approach. It's not looking at the stocks themselves, but it's looking at the whole uh, configuration of that system. So, so we heard that the, the TST term, I think you use T, is the total system through flow, and then the, um, the other, the Boltzmann um, adapted through flow term is based on the configuration of the network itself. So it's looking at the, the weighting is now the network configuration times the total system through flow. But in each one of these cases, it's an intensive variable times an extensive variable to give you some measure of overall complexity. Okay, and at the same time, we know that ecosystems go through this growth dynamic, this development dynamic, some sort of equilibrium, um, stasis isn't the right word because there's always things changing, but at least a balance perhaps is a better term. But then there's some catastrophe, some event or, or some internal uh, you know, rearrangement that takes place that kind of sets the system back again to an earlier stages of its development. And this, this ecological succession um, progression, you know, is shown here with an example of it might be a forest fire that is going to set the system back and we have then a fairly well established soil structure already so we can regrowth within a year or two and then we can get recolonization of the grasses and shrubs and pines and then maybe a hundred years, a couple centuries later, we're going to have reestablishment of the climax community uh, around this part of the world and, and also where I am, it would likely be oak hickory, beech maple forest, something along those lines. So, so this is the kind of pattern that I want you to keep in mind when I go through a series of different um, ecosystem properties and we're trying essentially to project those properties and, and hypothesize on how they would respond to this successional pattern that is going on. So, so this is a very important slide kind of to keep in mind as we go forward. And, and this was also put forward, um, this general dynamic um, by Buzz Holling 20 plus years ago now, which he termed the adaptive cycle. And the idea that was really key at the time when he introduced this was that ecologists were looking very much at the exploitation and the conservation phase, this basic logistic growth curve, right? There's a, a growth and then there's a, an equilibrium phase. And he added this whole additional loop, the closure of that loop, that it doesn't stop at the equilibrium phase. You've got some event that is going to release that uh, system, uh, collapse the system, depending, you know, um, whatever word you want to use, and then some reorganization that takes place. And either you're going to get, find the pointer here, you're going to get, um, is this over? you're going to get either a, a renewal of the system back again along a similar growth path, or it can be kicked off into another, uh, another starting point and, and become a completely different system, depending on how much uh, the, the disturbance was. And so this, this figure eight, this lazy eight figure, 
that, um, that Holling introduced, we've kind of modified it a little bit, and, and we had Buzz's approval last year when we discussed this in front of him, that he said, yeah, um, this is fine, it's okay. So, and this was actually Felix and, and, um, and his colleagues that have, have reoriented this a little bit so that the decrease is monotonic now. It makes a little more sense, right? This one, you, you're actually bumping back up again during the reorganization phase, and, and we asked Buzz about that, you know, well, why did you do that? And he said, well, aesthetically, this was nice. This looked good, and so, <laughs> That was the reason, but, but this is, you know, he agreed this is probably a, a more accurate representation. So you have the growth phase and the release phase is monotonic down um, to the reorganization phase. Okay, um, and again, these ideas uh, are in different literatures and not necessarily always that new that we have uh, Joseph Schumpeter, an Austrian as well, who was writing about this in the earlier 20th century and he called it creative destruction. He, he was an economist and he was looking at that collapse phase as a positive thing in terms of the economy because it allowed for the opening up of new in innovations, new configurations, new networks to get established. And so he was looking at this um, different waves that were going on in the industrial sector as well too. So, so a, one of the messages, I, I'm not focusing a lot on it in this particular talk, but that the collapse phase is not to be feared. The collapse phase is not necessarily a negative phase. It's oftentimes the, as Joseph Tainter says, the proper response of the system is to collapse because at that point it allows you to do new things. We don't like collapse perhaps, but um, it's not uh, necessarily a bad thing. This picture I think describes that quite well why it's not a bad thing is because now I'm plotting on the y-axis development potential. And you see here that development potential starts high when you've got a blank piece of paper, right? It's, it's many possibilities. You could write Shakespeare on this paper or you could just start scribbling on it. But once you start filling up that paper, you have less potentials to do something on it. So as the paper and the network gets more connected, your development potential goes down until you get out that eraser or throw away that piece of paper and start over again. So the collapse has benefits in terms of uh, increasing the overall development potential. Okay, so. What uh, Felix and another colleague of ours, Benjamin Burkhardt, who was here at this conference last year, who were working on earlier in this year, was looking at some of the different ecological or ecosystem properties that have already been discussed quite heavily in the ecosystem literature and, and kind of projecting and hypothesizing on how they follow or don't follow that lazy eight uh, pattern that we have. And so we've broken them down here. I'm going to talk about some of the energetic properties that are discussed, some of the network properties, and some of the system properties. So for example, physical exergy storage is, um, the, exergy is the amount of useful work that is in a system. So it's really amount of the, uh, the just the energy that is in that system. And it seems pretty likely that the energy is going to follow something pretty close to that figure eight curve. Because as the system, as this, again, these, these points represent the, that forced successional diagram that I showed you earlier. From early succession to mid succession at the, uh, point number two to that uh, equilibrium phase at point three, and then the end of, the, so three is like right when the fire starts, right at the beginning of the collapse, and then four is going to be the, uh, the reorganization at the end of the, the fire event. So the time, time scale is not um, depicted anywhere here, but to go from one to three might take several centuries, to go from three to four might take a few days, a few hours. Um, but the point is, is that, yeah, biomass takes a long time to accumulate. So totally exer total physical exergy storage would increase quite slowly um, along this logistic growth and then collapse quite quickly when that fire finally comes and wipes out the forest. Eco exergy storage, coming back to Jorgensen's idea, um, we thought that it grows fairly similarly along that uh, trajectory, but the collapse is going to be a little bit slower. It's going to come back on the top part of the curve. And, and we hypothesize that because um, it has to do with the genetic complexity. And as you start losing some species due to the fire, you're not necessarily going to lose all the genetic diversity immediately. And so you've still got some, some diversity that has that genetic code entrapped in it. So it's not until you have maybe the complete collapse that you are coming down um, to your, your four points. So it's maybe a little bit slower decline. Um, exergy capture is the forest's ability to um, to take in energy, it's the leaf area index. It's the amount of, of solar radiation that's captured. And that actually peaks fairly early. So you see now here the two point, there's not much additional energy that's captured for the later stages of succession because once you've got a canopy on your forest, you're, you're gonna take in the same amount of energy that you have. Even as those trees age from 80 years to 150 years, there's not much additional energy that's coming in to that forest. And here the collapse is, is fairly rapid because once that crown burns and you lose your ability, maybe that should even come down a little bit faster than we had, had drawn it there. 
energy um, follows a similar one where as the amount of, of energy biomass increases um, and levels off and then it, it's also going to come down um, fairly quickly when the, uh, when the forest fire comes through there. Total entropy production. So here's something that looks a little bit different. What's happening here is how much we, we're defining total entropy production in terms of the carbon dioxide that's generated. So the respiration term, in other words. But, re, but, it, but in terms of the forest fire, it doesn't just have to be respiration because then you have that pulse output. So that's why we get this very large peak here. So once the forest fire starts, you've got um, the highest point is when the fire is blazing the hottest, right? And it's generating the most entropy out of that system. So it's going to collapse very quickly after that, um, after that event. Okay, ascendancy. So here's what we heard about this morning too. Bob can tell us what he thinks of this particular graph. But um, one of the things about some of these network properties is that, um, as, as Bob mentioned, that you reach a certain point of... Um, of connectedness where your ascendancy um, peaks and then you, you actually, as you become more connected, it starts to decrease a little bit. So we're showing the, the, um, the highest ascendancy actually at kind of that middle developmental stage and then it, it comes down a little bit after that. It, it, there's some trade-offs that the ascendancy decreases in, in terms of increased uh, diversity and robustness that are going on there. So a little bit uh, different pattern that we had there. So now I'm into the network properties. I didn't point that out. but. Um, indirect effects and cycling. How much cycling is there in the system and how important are indirect effects? That's some of the work that's uh, very important with, uh, with Bernie Patton and, and his group, which, which I was trained within. And, um, and what we see here is that, yeah, as the network develops and, and uh, complexifies over time, it's going to follow the, pretty much the same pattern that we, we have in the background. But here the collapse is going to be very quickly because when the, when the catastrophe the perturbation comes in there and you start losing some of those connections, cycling is going to drop off very quickly because the, the closure of those energy flows are lost. Synergism and mutualism are two other network properties. I actually talked about those in more detail last year at this conference. And, um, and, and again, the idea that there's some limit to it, maybe this could even bubble up the way we did ascendancy, is that you can become overconnected. With these properties, they actually start to decrease in their value as you become more connected. So there's some sort of intermediate value where they're either going to come down a little bit or level off. So, so we believe that they, they would look something like this uh, along this pattern. Okay, now what about some of the system properties? And that brings us to the, the key themes, I guess, um, of the, the conference. Adaptability, we also feel that it's most adaptable when it's somewhere in that middle range. You know, so the, the two point, and then it starts to come down as the development potential decreases, as the, the connections become more intertwined, it becomes less adaptable. And so you actually get a loss of adaptability as the number of connections are increasing. And then a very quick drop off as the forest fire uh, burns through. Vulnerability, we felt pretty much was similar to the figure eight curve. It's going to increase um, along the logistic function and then come down maybe a little bit um, more rapidly than, than the nice eight pattern, but, but essentially, we called this our fish diagram, I guess, which we saw quite a bit too. It looks a little like a fish on its side with its nose and an eye. Um, and then lastly, to, to really throw some maybe discussion up here is we thought resilience was really the outlier to all of this. That resilience was the one function that was completely the opposite. That resilience starts very high and decreases the whole time during development until this three uh, when the forest fire initially hits and then resilience goes back up again. So maybe that's something we can talk about during the discussion. Maybe Lance will disagree or agree, we'll see, uh, as also an expert in this area. Um, so these were just some hypotheses we put forward on, on what uh, ecosystems are doing and you know the, the figure eight metaphor is is wonderful I think it really helps us understand these these uh, the, the system dynamics that the collapse is an integral part of it that the collapse is uh, you know oftentimes a necessary and even an, an important part of that um, but they aren't all going to follow that exact pattern there's going to be some variation depending on what the system property specifically that you're looking at is so in con conclusion um, I just said this, but all ecosystems, ecological systems, and social systems really go through these adaptive cycles of growth, stability, collapse, and reorganization. Um, we do have some metrics that are already in the literature that can track this development, at least in, uh, in some ways. And, you know, we rely on a greater allocation of energy to maintain these complex structures. So back to the sustainability question is as the system grows in complexity, uh, it's usually due to, um, you know, boundary conditions. More energy is going into that system up to a point. 
so, so we become dependent on those energy flows. And as I said, that resiliency actually decreases with connectedness because the risk of brittleness will grow with increasing connected, uh, connectivity. And that um, resilience really depends on system redundancy and organization. So it's that trade-off that, uh, that Bob was talking about, even though there was an important point that Bob used the word robustness, if you noticed in his definition, not resiliency. And I, maybe that will come out in the discussion if there's a really strong difference between robustness and resiliency. I, I think that there is, and I like actually your formulation better. It's more concrete, perhaps, than, than what we have currently with resilience, but some more food for thought. Um, I think I, I'm basically out of time. One minute or not? I had this one last slide to also throw things up a little bit. Um, Maybe you've heard of the Dismal Theorem by Ken Boulding, and when we talk about what are some of the problems as we go forward, and, and he had this really great um, concept of, um, about 40 years ago that the only ultimate check in the growth of population is misery, then the population will grow until it is miserable enough to stop its growth. And there's a corollary, or second theorem, the utterly dismal theorem, is that any technical improvement can only relive misery for a while. So long as misery is the only check on population, the improvement will enable population to grow and will soon enable more people to live in misery than before. The final result of improvements, therefore, is to increase the equilibrium population, which is to increase the total sum of human misery. <laughs> However, there's a moderately cheerful form which says that if something else other than misery and starvation can be found which will keep a prosperous population in check, then the population does not have to grow until it is miserable and starves and can be stably prosperous. So those are the kinds of governance solutions we're looking for, the moderately cheerful forms of that. So thank you. <clears throat>